Amongst the luxury car dealerships and billionaire apartments of Park Lane stands one of London's most legendary and pioneering hotels. When someone says the Dorchester to me, the first thing that comes to mind is absolute indulgence and opulence. When it was opened in 1931, it was revolutionary in the hotel world. The first reinforced concrete hotel ever built, and like nothing London had ever seen. It was built by Sir Robert McAlpine, who really wanted to have one of the top luxury hotels in Europe. And although from the outside it's quite concrete and, and sort of square, um, inside it's full of that 30s art deco glamour. And right from day one, it has always enticed the wealthy and well-known. The first memory of my first day at the Daughters was the opulence of the place. And in those days, it was uh, nearly every corner suite at the Daughters that had a permanent guest in. We had Jack Cotton in 120, who was a property magnet. Sir John Elliman in 620, who owned Elliman shipping lines. Lord and Lady Rank were permanently there. They were in 607. You really feel that there's a buzz there. I mean, there's always a chance that you're going to turn around and Jennifer Lopez or Tom Cruise are checking in and you get to see them walking through the lobby. The aim of the hotel was to bring the nations of the world together. The founders of the hotel were part of an organisation called Come to Britain. It was designed to attract people there and it worked. The clientele were plutocrats and they were aristocrats, but there was a bit more cultural mixing, perhaps, at the Dorchester than in some other places. As long as you could afford to pay the bill there, there were no problems about how well-connected you were or what sort of person you were. Although it seems there have been some exceptions. When it's money orientated, you don't always get the people you'd like. And I can remember being out, as a doorman being out there one evening and one of the managers came out who was always ready to pass the buck. And he said, oh, by the way, Ted, there's a chap in the bar. We'd like him to leave. Can you go and have a word? So I said, yeah. And I went and at the end of the bar was sitting Charlie Cray, one of the Cray brothers. Oh, dear. I thought, well, can't back off now. I walked up and stood in front of him. I said, good evening, Mr. Cray. He said, what do you want? Well, I said, sadly, Mr. Cray, the management would like you to leave and I was ready to get a little bit of bother. So I stood back a bit, uh, but no, he stared at me for a minute, got off the stool and walked out, and I breathed a big sigh of relief. It seems crime doesn't always pay, and even if it did, you'd need an awful lot of loot to stay at the Dorchester today. The hotel has 250 five-star rooms and 49 suites, and a penthouse could set you back over £5,000 for a single night. What's interesting about the Dorchester is that the names change, the faces change, the trends change, even what countries it is popular with, who's, what superstars arrive. But what hasn't changed is that it's always been that go-to spot in London ever since it opened its doors. Back in the 30s, it was all about foils, literary luncheons. It was people like Noel Coward, Cole Porter. It was Somerset Maugham, Cecil Day-Lewis. I mean, these were the superstars of their day. In the 1930s, that superstar set were all about London's latest fad. Originally, in the UK, the place to go when you wanted to have a cocktail was the hotel bar. And mostly it was because the people who really wanted the cocktails, especially during the Prohibition era, were American tourists. The elites of London saw that happening, and the bright young things saw that happening. They went crazy and started flocking to the hotel bars. Just seven years after opening, in 1938, the hotel decided to up its reputation as London's most modern hotel by redesigning the bar and poaching the best barman in the capital from rival hotel, the Savoy. Megastar mixologist, Harry Craddock. The hotel has always attracted the moneyed, and it was no different immediately after the Second World War. 
At the height of their glamour, the young Princess Elizabeth and her new beau, Prince Philip, before he was even Duke of Edinburgh, they epitomised the absolute cream of London society. And guess where they went to party? The Dorchester Hotel. Dorchester's always been quite popular with royalty. In the post-war period, there was about one function per week, a formal function that was attended by a member of the royal family, be that the king or queen at the time, or maybe Princess Elizabeth when she was just starting off her royal duties. Royal functions and society dinners have been a fixture at the hotel throughout its history. But if you're a mere mortal who's lucky enough to have an invitation land on your mat, how can you survive din-dins without making a right royal faux pas? A lot of the rules of etiquette go back almost to the, the dawn of man, when man first walked the, the earth. And over time, as society has changed and technology and cultural mores have changed, so has the etiquette. So the no elbows on the table rule, for example, goes back to the Middle Ages when the tables they used were not secure tables like this one today. They were trestle tables, they were benches with sheets of wood placed on top of them and they weren't secure. And so if you did put your elbows or any part of your arm on the table, it may tip. Let's imagine that suddenly, with no warning, you are next week going to be attending a dinner. Here is what you need to do. You arrive at the Dorchester. The doormen in their beautiful British racing green morning coats open the door of your taxi and they show you through into the hotel. No social media. Let's not tweet or post on our Instagram story that we're at the Dorchester. Keep your phone away and turned off. If you can make it through the front door without embarrassing yourself, you'll next be faced with the terror of the table. Especially if you're sitting on a round table, it can be quite confusing as to which side is your bread plate, which side are your water glasses. The key to remember is BMW. B for bread, M for meal, it's in the middle, and W for water and wine, it's on the right-hand side. Take the bread from this side, drink from that side, and then you're not stealing anyone else's food or wine. You don't need to put the napkin on your lap the moment you sit down. That shows that you're a little bit too eager, but really within sort of a minute or two of sitting down. Now, we're not going to do a big theatrical flick to the side. Instead, we just simply unfold it very gently and fold it in half, and it goes on the lap. We're not going to tuck it up here uh, because we're not a child. Uh, it goes simply on the lap. And when you come to use it, you take your finger, you wrap the napkin around your finger, and you dab very gently. There's not really supposed to be a lot of food on the napkin. If there is, something is going fundamentally wrong. The food should be going in your mouth and not around it. If you manage to eat food without causing a major diplomatic incident, how do you subtly alert the waiters? Now, if you imagine the plate as a clock and the cutlery as the hands of the clock, they would go at 6.30. Whereas if they're in the 3.40 position, crossed with the bridge of the fork over the knife, that's an indication that they are still eating, they are paused, they are resting, don't clear my plate. Just like when you arrived at the Dorchester after the dinner has finished. No tweeting, no posting about it on Instagram. Discretion is key if you want to be invited back. In 1947, there may not have been social media to worry about, but discretion was still the name of the game at London's most fashionable hotel. In fact, Prince Philip had his stag do there, so he's just about to marry the most important woman in the world. And that's where he goes for his last night of, you could argue, freedom. I suppose it's quite a notch for the Dorchester to say that uh, they hosted Prince Philip's stag night there uh, back in 1947. They invited some of the cameras along to see uh, Philip and his friends, including his uncle, Louis Mountbatten, having some drinks, having a good time. And these were then put in the paper. But ever conscious of public perception and being a private um, individual as well, Philip and his uh, friends then took the cameras off the photographers and said, we'll take your photo. And instead, they actually smashed the light bulbs so they couldn't take any further photos of any shenanigans that went on that night. Mm -hmm. 